Power. So um, without further ado, I'll introduce myself. My name is Mike Farrell. I'm an editor at the Christian Science Monitor and uh, work on a project called Passcode that uh, focuses on all things digital security and privacy. Uh, thanks to the EU for having us, to, to having me today and hosting this great panel. So uh, I'll introduce these fine folks and then we'll dive right into our conversation. So to my left is Andrea Glorioso. He's counselor for digital economy at the EU delegation to the US. So he focuses a lot on how the EU and the US can um, make progress on the broader global cybersecurity problems. Uh, to his left is Ann Hobson. She's tech policy fellow at R, the R Street Institute. Um, and uh, actually, we'll pause for a second. Can you just tell us what R Street is? Because I think a lot of people will not be familiar with that. Sure. So I'm a technology policy fellow, and I, I work on emerging technologies. But the institute itself is focused on free market solutions to a lot, a wide variety of problems. Thanks. Uh, did that much better than I could. Uh, Rafael Laguna is to her left. He's CEO of Open Exchange, with, which is uh, an open source enterprise software company based in Germany. And to his left is Chris Painter, who um, is with the State Department. He's been working on cybersecurity issues for uh, quite some time. So he is, uh, is going to um, tell us where, how far we've come and how far we have to go. So uh, we'll just jump into uh, the topic of the conversation is security of things. So, oh, sorry, security, cybersecurity and the Internet of Things. Um, as we were talking earlier today, it's, it's kind of when you talk about the Internet of Things, I mean, everything now is connected to the Internet. Uh, but to really get us rolling and define some of the terminology that we'll be talking about today, Anne is going to give us a, a 101 lesson on what the Internet of Things actually means. Thanks, Mike. So the Internet of Things is really an array of connected objects that can send and receive data. So that includes everything from smart TVs, or uh, routers even to your smartphones that you have in your pocket. I think it's a very wide variety. The scope and the scale of these things is what's the reason we're up here today talking about them because the connectivity and all of these aspects added together make it such that there are uh, wide vulnerabilities that um, we're going to be discussing in terms of trying to approach things like distributed denial of service attacks or other types of, of large scale attacks that can occur when these devices are co-opted to do them. So I think a, a lot of people woke up to some of the, uh, the vulnerabilities, the widespread vulnerabilities within the Internet of Things ecosystem after a recent botnet attack the, uh, as a result of the Mirai botnet. Um, Andrea, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about you know, what your reaction was. That was a, an attack that shut down um, many Internet providers, big ones and small ones alike, um, affected uh, Europe and the U.S. Uh, what was your kind of reaction to that? And um, what are some of the things that you're doing at the EU to solve some of these problems that are implicit in this ecosystem? Sure, <clears throat> sure. Um, I would say that among the people in the civil service of the European Commission, as far as I know, among people in industry, the Mirai attack was not a surprise at all because we knew very well, as we know today, that that particular infrastructure, uh, which as Anne said, is, is a very broad infrastructure, there are a lot of things uh, that can be put into the category of the, of the Internet of Things, uh, is, let's face it, not very secure. It's not very safe, uh, it's not very good in terms of privacy protection. So the fact that you could have such an attack uh, was not a particular surprise. What is different, uh, I have myself been working on these issues not as long as Chris has, uh, but for some time, uh, and I clearly remember that seven or eight years ago, if I were to report these kind of things to my to the politicians that I report to, they would kind of jump on their chairs and say, oh wow, how that is even possible. And nowadays when you report that, they, it's not that they're not worried, but their reaction is uh, a lot more, yeah, we know it's a problem. Which in a way is good if you want to see a silver lining in it, because it means that there is a lot more, uh, there is a lot more understanding, including among top decision makers in the public and the private sector, that there is an issue there. Now, where we still have an issue is that we know that there is a problem, but we have, <clears throat> sorry, 
to be clear, we have not yet been able to find, uh, if, if ever we can find a silver bullet solution to that problem. Now, as far as the European Union is concerned, uh, we have been dealing with cybersecurity for quite some time, uh, and I found it actually interesting. Anne wrote a wonderful paper, which I suggest all of you to read, uh, which she sent to us to prepare for this uh, panel on the Internet of Things, uh, and the first quotation that she puts there is actually a paper by a colleague from the European Commission. Um, I, I'm blanking on the name that now, which I shouldn't because I worked with the guy for a long time. And uh, um, Gerard Santucci, sorry. Gerard has been working on the, inter on the Internet of Things for at least 12 or 13 years. That's at least as long as the European Commission has been working on these issues and has been working also on the broader issue of cybersecurity. And I will not bore you with all the details of what we have done, just a few data points. Uh, Quite recently, we have finalized the negotiation, therefore the European Union has adopted our Directive on Network and Information Security, which imposes a certain number of obligations on member states and on the private sector in terms of data breach reporting, on having in place certain minimum risk management strategies. Now, that is not a silver bullet, but we have to be clear that both governmental entities so the obligations in this directive are aimed both at our member states and at industry. Both governmental entities and companies have certain responsibilities, which if I may be a bit blunt, have not necessarily taken up fully until now. If you put certain devices on the market and you know, and by now the industry knows very well, that those devices will be used to transfer enormous amounts of data. They can be used for the DOS attacks. They can collect a lot of data about our most intimate uh, moments in life then you need to have in place a certain minimum level of safeguards. I want to be clear that we at the European Commission, uh, nor as far as I know, the, the member states of the European Union, we think that regulation uh, is the only solution to the issue. We believe that the market can come up with very good solutions, but we also think, and I have to express a personal opinion here, I think industry had a lot of time to come up with solutions to this quite widespread issue, and I'm not entirely convinced that the results we have seen so far are very satisfactory, quite honestly. So, so Anne, since you name-dropped your paper, we'll just go to you, I think. Uh, do you agree? You'll I mean, only be here, by the way, after this. Yeah. But. Um, do you agree that uh, regulation, I think you said regulation is pr the only solution? No, to no, no, sorry. We, we don't believe that. We, we, do, not we believe. do not believe. We think it's part of the tools that we have to use to solve the problem. But you also did make the point that industry has had a long time to fix this problem and really hasn't, so... Uh, I, I think that it's fair to say, given what we see today, I think it's fair to say that the industry probably could do better. And I think that the problem there, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure Anna can talk much better about this than, than I could, uh, I'm not sure that incentives are, that the right incentives are there. Because if at the end of the day you do not have to really pay for the breaches that your products produce, uh, a rational economic actor, why should it spend money on, uh, on making the products more secure. I wouldn't if I were the CEO of a company and there is no penalty, my product being unsecure, my internet of things, my connected uh, toaster or fridge or whatever it is being unsecure, uh, why would I spend money on that? Especially in a market uh, such as the whole connected devices market, which is extremely competitive and where the margins are extremely low already from the start. So, so what do you have to say? Yeah, so one of the things that I look at in my paper is this lack of information that appears to be in existence. So, for example, I don't know how secure a device is when I'm buying it. Also, uh, the companies, to a certain degree, don't know how secure their supply chains are or what vulnerabilities they're getting when they're buying a processor. And so I think that um, from that perspective, there's a lot, there's a role for government to play. Um, and what they can do is really advance uh, some of the industry solutions to this. One of them is certifications. Another is, is information sharing efforts about threats. Um, and a third is cyber insurance. And my paper really focuses on that. And I think cyber insurance is pretty cool because it aligns incentives in a way that certifications do not. So in other words, if I'm going to invest in securing my products, I'm going to pay a lower premium. Um, and I'm also going to be protected in the case of a cyber attack. So I think there's that, that does a good job of aligning incentives in a way that we haven't seen so far. And those products are arising in, in uh, the market as we see today. And then lastly, I want to mention uh, aftermarket solutions, which are pretty cool. So basically, you can get a smart router, for example, that will monitor what you have in your house um, and, and give you control over being able to stop that. It'll also look at the traffic that are going from those Internet of Things devices. Um, and it'll analyze it to find malicious patterns and will inform you when those happen. So you can know when devices are parts of botnets, for example. 
And I think that that uh, way of empowering consumers to have the, that information about their products is a new and upcoming emerging solution to this. So there are some, some exciting industry uh, solutions that are coming to bear. Great. Uh, no, those, those are all great. Uh, Raphael, let's jump you in here. What do you, where do you come at this problem broadly, and what do you think of, of some solutions that we've, we've uh, talked about so far? I mean, the whole internet is a huge technology challenge, right? It's not like the industry knows what they're really doing when we're growing this network. I mean, look at ourselves here. We're now all connected all the time. We're looking at screens like 80% of our wake time. And I look at you now, you do, right? Uh, and we haven't been doing that before. Uh, and we're building a network, you know, n the non-internet of things is like six, million pe six billion people using it. Now we're adding another 20 billion or 50 billion billion devices to it. Nobody has tried that before, so it's quite a challenge. From an uh, industry incentive, I think, I think nobody wants to screw up. Nobody wants to build a crappy product. But then on, you say, if I was the CEO, I would I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> well, at least most people that stay relevant for a while don't. Because even the Chinese crappy camera maker, they had to call back four million cameras. That's expensive. Right? You don't want to do that. I mean, I'm, um, and Mike mentioned this, we're an open source company. When you look at the technology of the internet, this is all open source and open protocols. This is why it has become so big. But why is it so crappy? Because people take all this open source stuff amongst them, our products, and then wrap our stuff around them that makes the stuff bad and intransparent. So now, you know, them having sort of baked the product and not really, not really adhered to like the white papers we put out and how you build secure stacks, they just ignore that, or not reading the NIST recommendations, right, which are pretty clear on how you build secure stacks. That's the little piece that's screwing up the quality of the products. So I think, and we mentioned this in the discussion before here, that if we would adhere to these open source principles that are sort of at the heart and at the core of the internet, you could put out a you know, say, internet-connected camera stack, because the Chinese manufacturer doesn't differentiate because he has some cool software on there. You know, he wants to build cheap cameras. Now, if we would have a camera stack, you know, which is software and operating system, because these things are computers, so that the camera is a computer, and this is why it can be used for a botnet, that many, many people use, that has military use, government use, you know, and use in many, many companies that build products, you will get a better stack, a more robust stack, and everybody benefits from the work that goes into this, and now we have better products. I think that is also, from an economical perspective, wise to do that. Not only because you have less callbacks, but also your product will be better. And I think it sort of plays very well with the internet and the way the internet is built and what has made the internet so successful. So, Chris, uh, let's bring you into the conversation. Where do you come at this problem uh, at the State Department? And what are you thinking about lately around cybersecurity? So, I mean, first of all, let me say it's a pleasure to be here, especially uh, we, we in December just had our I think fourth or fifth uh, USEU dialogue on cyber issues, and, and that's been a really productive venue to discuss things like the Internet of Things. And not disagreeing with Anne's uh, definition of Internet of Things, I think one of the problems is that people think they use the buzzword of Internet of Things, and they, they don't really understand this is just a use case of a larger cybersecurity issue. Uh, and the same things we should be doing to protect ourselves uh, from all kinds of threats really do apply to this technology. Now, the, it, you know, it does have some interesting parts of it, like these are commodities, and so there's not a lot of incentive, as people have said, to build in security. I do think, however, that there's been some movement, especially with all the publicity around the latest denial of service attack and some other things, to, to uh, you know, have some reputational pressure on companies. And as we look at this, we can't look at this as just a national issue. These are always going to be international issues, especially when you're dealing with these internet issues. And, and I, I will tell my one Internet of Things joke now, which is the uh, Vin Cerf is fond of saying that he worries about the day when an army of connected refrigerators are going to attack your bank. Uh, that actually happened. There was actually a case of that. Uh, not your bank necessarily, but uh, financial institution websites. And I, uh, when that happened, I said that that was a great new example of freezing your assets. <laughs> so, sorry. It's still in research and development. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, as we look at this, there are a number of things that we've done. Um, and I think advances we've made. I do think it's important that people understand this is a problem. Um, you know, you mentioned um, that at, just a few years ago you tell a commissioner or a minister or a CEO of a company about these issues and they might jump on their chair and say this is terrible. They also might jump under their chair and hide from it and say you technical people just go deal with this. We're now in, in the U.S. and I think around the world this has become a core issue of national security, economic and, and uh, foreign policy. 
which means the solutions you look at have to be broader solutions. There are technical solutions, um, but you can't be too prescriptive in those. I worry when you talk about regulatory regimes that we don't even know what we're regulating. And if you come up with all these largely possibly competing and, and not interoperable regulatory regimes, that's worse than having some of the problems we're trying to solve. So, you know, I like the fact that NIST and DHS put out principles on Internet of Things and what some of the things you should be looking at are. I think we, we look at how we can work with other countries to deal with this. I think we should look at some of the best practices that are out there. Uh, I was in Singapore for Singapore Cyber Week back in, I think it was uh, November, and they wanted to start a consortium around security of Internet of Things. There are a lot of those, uh, and it's nice to have all those efforts, but we need to try to try to bring them together and have more interoperability and interdiscussion between them so we don't have all these orthogonal solutions. Um, but I think we can get there. I mean, I do think, you know, again, I think the fact that there's so much focus on this is a good thing. We had a cybersecurity strategy in the U.S. in 2003 which probably no, none of you know we actually had. Uh, and it was a national strategy. It was at the, the presidential level. And it became shelfware by 2004 uh, because people weren't ready for it. People didn't understand the nature of the problem or care. I think we're, where we are now is people get it's a problem, but they don't know what to do about it. And although we've made, you asked me in the opening, how, you know, how, what we've done and, and where we're going, I think we made a lot of progress, frankly. I think we have a lot to do. And part of it is just coming up with those policies to, to deal with these threats but not having to come up with a new policy every time you have a new iteration of that threat. And, and Andrea, I think you want to jump in. With yes, that. just uh, um, just to react very briefly to Chris' point on uh, the regulatory regimes. Uh, uh, we agree, and I want to be very clear on that. It's in nobody's interest to have uh, uh, diverging regulatory approaches uh, uh, between certainly not between Europe and the US, which let's face it are the two largest markets right now and the two largest economies. Maybe we, we don't, do not produce uh, as many chip covers as China does, but we have a lot of expertise and technology production in our, on our shores. Um, nor uh, do we believe that we should regulate uh, an environment which we do not understand yet fully. However, having said this, I will also add two things. The first is that this is not a new environment. We have had the Internet of Things for quite some time, and before we actually came up with the Network and Information Security Directive, which is, by the way, a horizontal directive. It doesn't, it's not the Internet of Things Security Directive. It's the Network and Information Security Directive, which applies to all different uh, uh, technological fields or how technology is used in different industry sectors. We did a lot of discussions with the industry, which went on and on and on, uh, according to me, even a bit too long. But in any case, we had that kind of debate. And if you look at the content of the directive, uh, we, I, I believe, uh, that's not only the party line, but also what I personally believe, uh, that it is not technologically prescriptive, it is not uh, sector-specific prescriptive. We're basically putting in place certain baseline obligations, again, for governmental entities within the European Union and for industry, that they have to respond to in the way that they want to respond to. So Anne mentioned the, important, the, the importance of having information sharing. Uh, Again, sorry to be blunt, but the importance of information sharing is something we have been knowing about and talking about for a long time, and not many players have actually done a lot about it. So what we have done in Europe is simply saying, look, you have to do it. Do it the way you want. Share what you think is important to share or relevant to share, but do share that kind of information. And in, in addition, uh, because the directive uh, puts this baseline, which is quite generic at the end of the day, we have a whole process to create what we call in Europe a tertiary legislation or delegated acts, which will define, or implementing acts, will define in more detail how do you actually apply this to different subsectors. And in that process, industry is fully involved. If it is not because it doesn't know that it's happening, please let us know because we want all the industry to be involved. But at the end of the day, I, I think we also had to realize the politics of all of this. As the digital technologies and the internet uh, become more and more intertwined with our daily lives, uh, it's not anymore the router that allows you to connect to your internet, and it's not only your toaster or your fridge, it's also your industrial control system. It's also your nuclear plant control system. Uh, if something happens there, then the political pressure to actually over-regulate will be enormous. And I'm sorry, I've been in politics for some years. Uh, it will not be possible to resist that kind of political pressure if something bad happens, which as we've seen with Mirai, it can very well happen. So from our perspective, it's better to put in place some kind of regulatory regime which is as light touch as possible, but yet puts in place certain baseline requirements that 
in the details on how they had to be implemented, we leave it very much to industry to cooperate on how to do that. So I, I think we, we've not been good even in the past, though, of, of laying what the baseline is. And so the, you know, the reason there is not that, you know, there is a better insurance regime now than there was. But one of the problems with an insurance regime is you need underwriting standards. And that hasn't been there. And look, I'm, I'm a recovering lawyer. So, you know, there's a lot of litigious people out there. Uh, and we haven't really seen a lot of lawsuits or other things or liability. And I think part of that is there's not really been a defined standard of care or even understanding what that is. But I think a lot of these voluntary frameworks help generate that over time and generate standards in the industry. And I think that does drive a lot of these different issues. And, and I, you know, we've tried, we have the NIST framework, which is a voluntary framework. It's not one size fits all. It deals with the, you know, the different sectors. Um, information sharing, I agree with you. I think we've been talking about information sharing for as long as I can remember. And there's all these impediments all the time. First, it's antitrust. Then it's liability. Then it's uh, Freedom of Information Act issues. And we've overcome all those speed bumps. But you're still not going to get information sharing unless there's a business reason for them to share it or for the government to, do, to, to share the information back. And that's something I think we also need to solve. So not just being prescriptive, but making sure that it's meaningful what you're sharing back and forth. And I think, again, that's getting better, but there's a long way to go. And did you want to jump yeah, in here? Yeah, so I think to add on, the NIST cybersecurity framework is it's doing a good job of creating a common language that everyone can speak in. So uh, insurers can build their modeling off of that, but also um, you have companies then that can, can see what's important and be able to communicate that to other companies. So there are a couple of information sharing uh, efforts that are out there. One of them, you can actually go see a couple blocks that way. There's uh, IBM, and they have, uh, I, I believe it's called like, uh, force or X Force, um, and, and that's one of the voluntary ways to share information. Facebook has a threat exchange as well. Um, and yes, I don't think these things are going to be silver bullets, but I do think they can get us 5% of the way there, a little bit closer. And that's because this is such a complex uh, problem, and, and there's so many players internationally involved. Internet of Things devices are everywhere. There are actually more devices than there are people on the planet. Like, that's, that's a problem that requires everybody. Um, governments and industry. And so I think that from an information sharing perspective, that's just one piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Rafael, do you have? Yeah, you know, we do have some real concrete examples of where regulation changes the way the industry behaves already, like with the upcoming uh, GDPR regulation from the EU, and Andrea can explain what it stands for, but basically it says that you have to pay significant fines if you're a telco and you're providing a, a service platform to people and you're being hacked and you lose data. Right? And that translates into up to, I think it's 2% of your revenues, which can be tens of millions of dollars or pounds or euros or whatever you do. So now we as Open Exchange, we built platforms for telcos, email platforms, for example, DNS platforms. And now, of course, the telcos turn around and say, hey, Raphael, right? we, we, want you to, we want to hold you liable and we want our money back right? if we have to pay those fines because your platform was broken into and data got lost. So now I turn around to the insurance companies and I say, hey, I need insurance for, say, up to 80 million pounds is one concrete example that I have. And the insurance companies go like, whoopsie, right? we're not really prepared for that. There is no product. I've never heard an insurance company go whoopsie. Go whoopsie. I was, it was actually the broker. <laughs> right? that, that sounds like uh, you know, sweet business for them. It, we're probably looking at at a insurance policy that costs us a quarter million dollars a year or something. So it is, you know, whoopsie for a broker if he can't sell a product into that, right? Because he would get a lot of money for it. I mean, certainly there's an incentive for car makers, for instance, to make sure their the connected device, the software they're putting in cars is secure. Um, and others, I mean, where there's real harm that can kind of come from these problems. Well, well, and let's, let's, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, again, it's trying to... People often separate the cyber world from the rest of the world, and it's grounded in the rest of the world. And so if, you have, if there's a, a defective software or a vulnerability that leads a self-driving car to go off the tracks or there's something about a medical device, there's still going to be liability for that. I mean, I, I would imagine. You know, I, I don't think these cases have been tested, but I think whether it's a cyber means or a non-cyber means that does those things with certain sensitive areas... And you also have to remember there are some regulatory regimes around certain sensitive critical infrastructure, certain sensitive things like health care products. Um, and you have to take that into account when you're thinking about this too. I'm, I'm less worried about the denial of service attack we saw, as problematic as it was, is I'm worried about the integrity of data. I'm worried about someone getting in and changing your health care data so that if you get a transfusion and someone's changed your blood type to a different blood type, you die. That's probably worse than not being able to get to your bank site for an hour. So those are the things I think will be more worrisome. 
but then again, I think you also have some uh, protections and regimes that are built around that in the physical world that apply. Your, your example on cars is, I think, is a very good example for two or three reasons. The first is that you are looking at a sector which has been uh, not always heavily regulated, but as soon as it started to grow, I mean, the car, when the car industry was born, there was not a lot of regulation around, and people could build basically whatever car they wanted, they could drive around as much as they wanted, because you had, I, I'm making up the numbers, one car every 1,000 inhabitants, and so that was not really an issue. Once the car industry became to, started to become really widespread, uh, and therefore you had more cars on the street, the cars could go faster, and they could do more damage to people, then that sector started to become more regulated. And I guess the question is, if we are able to manage this Internet of Things sector, which I think is challenging for all the reasons that we said, not the least because you know, we are talking about connecting refrigerators, that's a kind of consumer facing and very cool, I want one of those by the way, and they're all very cool, but it's not the same thing as, I made example, as an industrial control system which is fully automated, which where you know, accidents can produce very concrete and real damage, economic damage, physical damage. So the question is, assuming we can define this Internet of Things sector, are we already at a stage in which this particular industry is so widespread and can have such an impact that we should heavily regulate it or not? From our perspective, if you look at both of the general data protection regulation, which is the GDPR that was mentioned before, which, this, which deals, deals really mostly about privacy and personal data protection, or about the Network and Information Security Directive, which is more towards cybersecurity, we tend to take, a, from our perspective at least, a, a rather proportionate and graduated approach, because we do recognize both in the GDPR and the NIS Directive, the Network and Information Security Directive, that there are certain sectors that are particularly sensitive, the nuclear industry, the, the transportation industry, etc., and there we have to be more careful. We have to be a little bit more regulation, if you will. There are other areas in which, quite frankly, yeah, okay, people can get upset if their connected fridge doesn't correctly recognize how much milk you have in the fridge, and then in the morning you don't have milk, that's not the end of the world. So I want to be clear on that, that it, in the European Union, in all the debates in the European Union about these issues, including on the, in the Internet of Things, I do not see, and I've been working on this for quite a long time, uh, I do not see a knee-jerk reaction we need to regulate. But I think we have to be, if I can be blunt, we have to be intellectually honest and recognize that this has become a very important sector with deep, whose dysfunction can have a deep impact on the economy, at least in certain cases on the economy. And therefore, I think it's fair that we at least think about sensible, proportionate uh, regulation in order to create, and I'm not saying maybe we're not doing it right and we can have a debate about that, but the goal is to create those sorts of incentives, uh, primarily for industry, so that they start to behave, uh, from our point of view, in a more uh, uh, secure manner, in a more uh, uh, socially, I would say even a um, socially conscious manner, because, and I'm not talking about anybody on the panel, of course, not anybody in the room, but we have seen several examples of companies which basically dump products on the market. They didn't really care about the effects of those products. They made a lot of money out of it. And I think that <clears throat> Raphael mentioned, or maybe it was Chris, the issue of liability. I remember having a conversation, a discussion about liability of software producers forever, forever. And they resisted that very notion, the conceptual notion from the very start because they didn't want to take the responsibility. Now that that software or software is using cars, uh, unavoidably they will have to take that, uh, that responsibility as well. So I want to shift the conversation just a little bit since we're talking broadly about you know, international cooperation. Uh, and you know, think broadly about international norms around cybersecurity and how nation states, uh, uh, perhaps not Europe or the US, but engage in cyber activities and what's acceptable or not. I mean, we, we just came off an election cycle where cybersecurity was a big deal, um, and we're still dealing with the ramifications. So, Chris, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you're engaging with your counterparts around the world to sort of establish some rules of the road for how they, we behave in cyberspace. So, so there are a lot of different threat actors in cyberspace. There's everything from kind of the lone gunman criminals to transnational organized criminal groups to even... Potentially terrorists, we haven't really seen it yet other than using the internet a lot. They haven't actually used it to launch attacks. Uh, but one of the actors is nation states. And so you look at each of these groups and you have to figure out, well, how can we mitigate the harm that could be caused or at least dissuade and deter them? And for criminals, it's good criminal laws and criminal enforcement. For nation states, 
you have to, you know, this is still a space where there's not a lot of understanding. Uh, there was a time when people thought that cyberspace was so totally different that you have to write an entire new rule book for it, entire new laws for it. And indeed, to some extent, you know, some countries like China still believes that they need additional laws for this. So one part thing we've been trying to advance is that the laws that you have in the physical world, particularly things like the international humanitarian law, the UN Charter, the, what they call the law of armed conflict, when you get to the cyber war, which we never really see, it's a much spoke about thing that doesn't happen that often, that those apply in the cyber world, just like they do in the physical world, and that's more stabilizing just because of that. But then because we don't see that conduct very often, what are other rules of the road? What are voluntary norms, as we call them, of conduct between states that they should, what we call norms of restraint, states should not do, even though they can do them, or uh, cooperative norms, things that they should do, affirmative norms. So the ones that we focused on are things like you should not attack the critical infrastructure of another country. One state should not do that, absent wartime. Wartime, there are rules of distinction, and proportionality, and things like that, which apply. Uh, you shouldn't attack the cert, essentially the, the, you know, the ambulance, the, the, uh, you know, the doctors of the internet. You shouldn't be attacking them in another country. You should use your certs for good uh, and not for offensive purposes. Uh, that you should, um, uh, if there's malicious code, now this is more of an affirmative one, malicious code coming from your territory, another state asks you, you should use law enforcement or network security means to help, help mitigate. There's an expectation of that. And then one that's more of an e economic one, which we reached with the Chinese, this uh, agreement that neither country would steal the intellectual property using cyber means of the other for purposes of benefiting their commercial sector. That's something we don't do. Um, we don't think any country should do. Uh, it was a landmark achievement to get China to understand that there was, or to admit, there was a difference between that and the kind of intelligence gathering every state does, uh, and say they wouldn't do it. After that, Germany reached a similar agreement, the UK reached a similar agreement, the G20 has that enshrined in it. So those norms, I think, are very helpful, helpful as a stabilizing man. The third thing is confidence building measures, which is transparency measures. But, but, you know, people often say, I've heard people say, well, you have all these norms out there these rules of the road out there. But people violate them, so what good are they? Uh, and I think that misses the point. People violate norms in the physical world all the time. You see this with incursions into territory and other things that happen. But they set rules of accountability or levels of accountability where like-minded countries can band together and act against the transgressors. And as we get more and more countries to embrace this kind of stability framework, I call it, the better off and more stable we are in the long run. Is it the silver bullet? No, it's one part of the larger fabric of how we address these risks. This is long-term nation state stability. You still need to look at all the other tools you have, whether they be economic sanctions, criminal activity, criminal uh, indictments, et cetera, uh, or other tools that states have to sanction conduct they find unacceptable. But this is an important long-term effort. And uh, so we, we mentioned this earlier of, uh, before we talked a little bit as well, but uh, there has been some um, reporting out there that the deal with the Chinese is, has uh, been successful in some ways. What have you seen on that, or what can you tell us about that? So the, I'd say that you know, my, my last time I testified about this, the, uh, the jury is still out, and certainly we're looking very closely. Uh, our communities continue to look closely. I think that there's been a lot of commercial services out there who see, said that they've seen a dramatic improvement in this. Uh, and I think that's good. I mean, I think the whole point was to say this is a, a level of activity that wasn't unaccept that was unacceptable. At the same time, you know, if uh, that commitment is breached, we then have to be ready to enforce that commitment, and that could be using the full tool set that we have. Again, economic tools, criminal tools, other tools, and it can't just be us. I mean, these are these are not country to country issues often. Uh, that theft of intellectual property issue was affecting us. It was affecting, I think, virtually every country in the EU. I, I doubt there was any that was excluded from it. Some were big, bigger targets than others. Um, and you have to act together as a community to sanction that kind of behavior. And I, I think we're trying to build those understandings and those alliances to allow us to do that. Do you think there's room for an agreement with Russia on acceptable cyber norms when it comes to elections? You know, uh, I, I think that's something that we'd, we'd have to explore, certainly. I think Russia was one of the countries that part of the, this group of governmental experts has signed on to these norms that I just talked about earlier. So what's, what's happening on the EU in that front in terms of coming up with, you know, either country-to-country uh, -country agreements, perhaps with China? I know an EU does not have a similar agreement with China when it comes to cyber espionage. But do you see that as sort of 
helping solve this broader cybersecurity issue that we're talking about? I think to the extent that we are, uh, first of all, uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, we have been having a cyber dialogue with the U.S. for quite some time, uh, and uh, I've been attending many of those, not all of those, but as far as I know, we are pretty much in alignment on every single thing that we discuss in those dialogues. Whether formally there is a participation of one particular actor in agreement that the U.S. might have with China or not, I think that's part of the mechanics of international politics and sometimes even domestic politics. Uh, you don't necessarily want, uh, if you're a U.S. leader and you want to sign an agreement with a third country, you don't necessarily want Europe to be in the middle, let's put it this way. But bottom line is that there is a lot of uh, alignment that we need to have common rules of the road. Uh, we need to have common norms. Uh, Europe has officially taken the position that yes, you should apply existing international law to, um, to the cyber war, whatever you, how you want to define it, including when it comes to the Internet of Things. Uh, I think our position uh, when it comes uh, to the, uh, our focus uh, as the European Union, as opposed to what some of our member states might focus more, as you know, we have a slightly different system than in the US, so a lot of uh, military slash national security matters are left to the member states to deal, so I, I cannot speak to that. Uh, but when it comes to what the European Union does with third countries, uh, certainly in our dialogues with China, certainly in our conversation with Russia that have now kind of moved down from being formalized dialogues to continuing to talk because, quite frankly, the situation in Ukraine, etc. but we still continue to talk. The bottom line there is uh, we want everybody to realize that certain minimum level, certain minimum standards of safety of cybersecurity in these products that have any way a global impact are in the interest of everybody. What we also want to avoid, and we had a very good cooperation with the U.S. government in dealing with China on this matter, we don't want cybersecurity, and that's a risk, and that's a risk particularly as we move towards this Internet of Things where you have a lot of cheap mass production. You have countries such as China, which sees this as an opportunity for its own economic development. We don't want to see cybersecurity used as a protectionist measure. And we've seen China, various draft of China cybersecurity law, which, at least in the drafts, would impose all kinds of obligations to foreign producers to give to China their intellectual property, the source code of their products, uh, or in order to comply with certain rather vaguely defined cybersecurity requirements to operate in the country. That's one clear example in which uh, the European Union and its member states, plus the US, have told China very clearly, the Chinese government very clearly, no, don't do that. It's, we do not agree, and I think there is a lesson to be learned there, at least from my perspective, that in all these matters that we're discussing, if Europe and the US, we need to accept our sometimes different approaches, we need to accept that we come from sometimes a slightly different background, we have different, but we have a lot more in common in terms of how we define the problem, how we want to solve the problem, where do we want to be once we have solved the problem, how much we should let industry work on this. Again, there are small differences, but certainly the small differences between Europe and the US are much, much, much less than the differences of either country with the way that China is dealing with this stuff or Russia is dealing with this stuff. And I think we should keep that in mind so that we, we don't let these small differences get in the way of pushing the rest of the world towards a more sensible approach to the cybersecurity of the, of the Internet of Things and of the Internet and digital technologies more and, generally. And if I could just add that, I mean, one of the things I think has been interesting over the last six years, really, is six, my office was created in the State Department six years ago. There was no other office like mine in the foreign ministry. There were offices in various technical ministries or you know, certainly DG Connect or others. But, but it wasn't a foreign policy issue. It was often ministries of communication talking about this who had one part of this puzzle but not the whole thing. But when, you know, like what, what you were just saying, when you look at some of these cybersecurity laws which have implications not just for security but also for economic protectionism uh, for human rights, people often use cybersecurity as a way to impinge on human rights. You have to look at all these issues together, and it does become more of a diplomatic issue. And, and so now there are 24 around the world offices like mine, including in China and Russia, but also in Brazil and India and virtually every country in Europe. And that's helped uh, raise the conversation so you're dealing with some of these cross-cutting problems. So, so Rafael, as the, as the representative from industry on the panel, you know, uh, uh, how do you feel about the regulators sort of poking around more into your space? I mean, for, for a long time, it's been kind of hands-off, right? You, we've relied on the industry to kind of police itself, come up with standards, voluntarily follow standards. If the cybersecurity problem moves to such a place where regulators do step in with a more active role, does that begin to worry you? 
Well, first of all, I'm happy that I'm in the industry and not in politics, I have to say, because it's such a, such a complex and you know, winding road you have to take. I probably wouldn't be patient enough for it <laughs> to take it. I mean, we've seen, like, a, a, big, a big thing in Europe was, for example, what's now called Privacy Shield, which was Safe Harbor before, which was sort of a, a self-certification for U.S. companies that they comply to EU privacy rules. Uh, which, in a way, is a little funny because the privacy rules are not very coherent between the EU and the US. So um, here, I guess, we have a very <clears throat> big stumbling block, I should say. I, I did not like it, and I do not like it. Uh, Sorry, you do not like it. The, uh, the privacy shield uh, regulations, because they, they sort of try to cover the actual issue about how data is being handled in the different countries. So in a way, that was my first experience with how regulation came, came to play in the industry. But there are very good examples too. I think, for example, the GDPR regulations that are coming up, which again deal with privacy and what happens if you lose data of people you know, to the public, I think that creates a huge incentive in the industry to become more careful and to be less like, for example, Yahoo was or so, right? Not even announcing that I had a breach to begin with, but even having the breach. I mean, we all may get hacked, but why not encrypt the data at rest, you know, make sure that if data gets stolen, it's really useless. Uh, announcing, you know, such uh, break-ins much earlier and be more upfront with the information and so forth. I think that needs to be incentivized uh, to the industry. So, so in a sense, it's, it's a mixed bag. You know, sometimes, I mean, the whole discussions around encryption, for example, that has been going on here in the U.S., I don't think it's that big anymore. But, you know, do, does, is there going to be a government-imposed sort of back door to encryption, which means there is no encryption if you do that, right? So there's either one or the other. Those discussions were, were a little scary for the industry, but I think they've taken, at least it seems for now, they've taken the, the right road. So I, I wish, long story short, that you know, politics and industry would be working together a little more closely. You know, politicians asking the experts in the industry about things because usually the answers are quite binary that you get. You know, things work or don't in technology, and vice versa. I would wish the industry would listen more to the things that are actually being discussed. You know, on the level of the U.S. state or uh, government, federal government, or the EU. So, so Anne, um, you're somebody who worked in the private sector, you used to work at Facebook in the policy shop in Washington, and now you're at a think tank. Um, I mean, I think during the Obama administration, we saw a lot of dialogue between Silicon Valley and DC. Um, do you see that happening in the Trump administration? And uh, if so, are there some early signs that that dialogue is starting up? Yeah, one of the things that was really exciting to see was as part of the campaign process, uh, Trump actually had a cybersecurity part of his website devoted to looking at the data breaches that occurred. So Yahoo was a really big one. So it seemed the that DNC he was... data breach, he missed that one. That one, pretty big. Okay. So, uh, so some of these things um, really attracted the attention of the administration. And I think that with the cybersecurity EO that has not yet, executive order that has not yet um, come out, but has some drafts have been sent out, there, that there is going to be a focus um, on things like federal IT modernization. Um, and that's, that's exciting. Also critical infrastructure is, is a huge area, um, which, which should be focused on. But uh, I think we can expect to see, uh, get a clearer picture of how he plans to focus on this with the executive order. Um, but it was good to see that this was an area of concern before he got elected. Are there particular things that either you or Chris can talk about in the draft executive order that you were particularly uh, pleased to see? I know it's been floated around out there. The Post published it. Which version? Yeah. Uh, how many versions? Which version? Have there been? Because I personally saw at least four draft versions. I would not comment on any of those, but there are four draft versions out there. So. All right. Well, pick your best draft version. Uh, I think uh, IT modernization is, is an area that's that's pretty significant, um, especially because agencies. Uh, focusing on the government's own cybersecurity approaches is, is extremely critical given things like the DNC hack. Um, they are a target. They also have a lot of information that you or I would care to not be out there, such as uh, social security numbers or tax history or even health information. Uh, so I think that there should be a higher standard of security for the federal government. Um, and some of the things that they can focus on, and uh, in my paper I focus on this, is cyber insurance. Uh, applying that standard uh, to their own federal contractors that they work with. Because a lot of the times, human error and focus and uh, using vendors is another area of vulnerability that can uh, result into, in some of these breaches. One of the biggest examples of that was John Podesta's email account, which 10 years of his emails were 
uh, put out there for the public to see because he clicked on a malicious link. Um, and that he was told not to. He was given unclear instructions by his IT guys. Um, but in, an, in the end of the day, there's still 25% of, uh, of uh, a human error, uh, attacks that are due to human error. And so I think that awareness, and maybe we, we can go back to the international scene here, uh, that I think that you can actually raise awareness and increase cyber hygiene by uh, looking at what users can do on the other end to protect themselves from cyber attacks. I mean, I can't, I'm not going to comment on the executive order until it comes out, but yeah. I will say this. I mean, it's good there is an executive order. It shows that there, you know, we want to build on what we have and continue to make progress. And, and the person who has taken the position of uh, Homeland Security, Assistant the President for Homeland Security, Counterterrorism, and does Cyber Tom 2. Tom Bossard. Yeah, Tom Bossard is a guy who's had some involvement in the past and interest in this issue. And so that's, that's important, too. And we all know that John uh, Podesta loves risotto. So um, you brought up a good point. So um, what can consumers do in this space? So uh, I'd love to get everyone's sort of you know, two cents on what consumers should do. I mean, we have buying power. We can spend more money, buy more secure products. That would encourage the industry. We could uh, start downloading secure you know, messaging apps or uh, those sorts of things. So I mean, what do you talk to? when you tell people about what you do, they say, oh, my God, how can I protect myself? What's your you know, short answer for them? Uh, I think, first of all, we have to be careful to consumers have a role and have a responsibility. Citizens have a role and responsibility. We should be very careful not to shift the responsibility towards them because, let's face it, in most cases, they, they are not the ones with the best information or expertise uh, to actually protect themselves. That's usually the producers of the technology, etc. Having said that, I think the one recommendation that I would give and that we are giving to people and users, consumers, citizens, whatever you want to call them, is do not think that these technologies do not impact you. Do not think, to, to, to make the point, to remake the point that Chris already made, this is not a separate word. If something goes wrong, it will have a direct impact on your life. So please do change that 0000 pin code on your tablet because you're putting your life in there. And I, I always, you know, I take as an example when I talk to my father about these things, he's very passionate about technology, but quite frankly, he doesn't understand a lot about it. And once you make him or other people in the same situation understand that, this will have a direct impact on your life. Uh, it's not all in the cloud or in the Internet of Things, in the virtual world. Then they start to do some things, this cyber hygiene uh, stuff that I mentioned that can be helpful. But again, I want to underline, let's not shift the blame, the responsibility towards consumers. Uh, that would be a bit too cheap and too easy. There are many other players which have the resources uh, and the expertise and the knowledge and the responsibility to do more about this. Anybody else want to jump in on that? I think, I mean, I think one of the other panelists mentioned this earlier. I think one of the problems is that uh, the reason consumers can't act is they don't have a lot of information right now. So getting them more information, certainly awareness is part of that, and there's been a lot of activities around that over the years. Uh, but also getting them information so they can make intelligent choices about, because I do think in part, you know, people will select more secure products, even if it's like a penny more than they will non-secure products, given they now see the, uh, the effects this could have. And it's one thing when the effect is, you know, someone steals your credit card and your bank makes you whole. It's different when you're losing personal information and it has a longer term effect on you. I think people do care about that. And we do have consumer protection when it comes to things like food, for example, right? And we make the industry sort of print the contents of that stuff on the box that you're buying. So you have a chance to assess, you know, you know what's in there, what, what, what you're eating. I guess you could do that for internet services too, right? You could say, you know, is this data encrypted addressed? You know, is the connection encrypted? Uh, does it have, you know, two-factor authentication? I mean, that all sounds very technical, but you can make it, you know, very consumery by just having a green or red, you know, check marks uh, on the box. And the more green, the better, right? Uh, I, I think that would be something uh, that would make consumers think twice before they use a service. I, I think right now we're sort of in the early stages of this internetification of the world. So we, we behave like idiots, right? <laughs> like, like the car drivers in 1900 when there were no rules. And, you know, I don't know if you know, but I know for Germany for sure, in the 70s we were killing about 40,000 people on the roads. Right? And then we came up with more rules, how the cars were to be built, you know, seat belts and, and that kind of stuff. Now we're down to 3,500. It's still too much, it's still 10 a day, but it's not 100 a day anymore. So we've improved quite significantly, and I think we could do that for internet-based services and devices, because they are no different, right, uh, as well. 
Before I get, let you jump in on that, I want to also uh, say that if you guys have questions out here, you've been very patient listening to us a chat. Um, please just uh, raise your hand. I think we, you know, we're a small enough group that you can just shout out a question and we'll answer it. Um, Oh, yeah. uh, sorry, Sinha, great to see everybody. Uh, well, wait one, sorry, one, wait one Please second. Please use the mic as yes. we're streaming. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Sunny Sinha, thanks for everybody for doing this great panel. Uh, one of the things that, I, that I've been seeing, and I actually rep a lot of next generation cybersecurity companies, is that A, cybersecurity is very, very hard, and B, the level of engineering um, that occurs from the offensive level, as in the things that you can do from the hacker side, versus the defensive level on how you defend, there's still a significant gap. What are the type of market development initiatives that you guys have seen to try and actually close that gap and, and turn this more into a private sector free market issue? Or have you looked at it that way? Anybody want to take that? Wow, you stumped the... the, uh, I, I, the I mean, I, this, this is partial answer to that. One thing I've seen is kind of moving it up the stack a little bit. I've seen a lot of the ISPs take more action to protect the, their users. Uh, and that's actually been a marketing thing they've used for that. You know, I saw that in Germany 10 years ago, now it's coming to the US. So, so that, I mean, that's not protecting companies necessarily, but it's also companies who are their customers, but they do these managed service and other things where that's been effective. So the, I think that's one element of it. Yeah, I can also add on. Uh, there's actually IBM down the street again. They're, uh, they're demoing the use of AI in analyzing a lot of cyber threats. And I think that's, that's pretty interesting. You can see a cool map where it shows what types of attacks are happening to different countries. And that's a paid for service, um, which I think is hard because that information would be beneficial to a lot of actors. Is cybersecurity really that hard? I mean, you, you, oh. you, I mean it seems like the, you, there's some pretty basic principles that could be applied that I, I, a lot of people are, just aren't doing. And that's yeah. where you get into a lot I mean, of problems. Look, I th I think you get, people make up these numbers, like 85%, 90%. I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but it is true the vast amount, vast number of intrusions that you see today are easily fixed, easily plugged. Uh, and you know, really dedicated, uh, sophisticated actors are a smaller percentage, and they are difficult, and they're difficult to get out. But that's not most of what we see. And that's not even most of the tools that they use, because they can get into these systems pretty easily. So I do think it's, it may not be as hard as it's, uh, it's chalked up to be. If, if I may echo to answer partially the question, and this is a personal view, by the way, it's not the official European Union position, I think we do need to accept that the attack surface is just very big. And if an attacker, the attack surface, meaning the, you know, the, the, the number of ways in which uh, we are exposed uh, to potential cyber attacks, uh, whether it's against our privacy or against our safety, is it, just very large. And we will need to shift uh, our approach to how we consider our personal safety because there is no way that I don't see the people, I do agree with Chris, the people, or whomever said it, the people will pay a little bit more for more secure products. Uh, I think there is, that, that is true. But I don't think that uh, we will ever have products or technologies, whether it's based on artificial intelligence, something else that can truly protect us. And that to me personally, suggest that we need to explore, uh, to explore a lot more uh, what happens after an attack, whether that's through insurance uh, mechanism, uh, what's to be prepared uh, for before the attack, knowing that an attack will happen uh, and be prepared afterwards. Having said all of this, as Chris said, uh, and I don't have the numbers either, as Chris said, I believe people make up these numbers, but my experience after several years working in the space, both in the private sector and in the, gov in the government, by the way, is that the vast majority of attacks that we see are really stupid, and it could be prevented with very minor, with very minor practices, very easy practices. We tend to focus a lot on the kind of national state cyber intelligence attacks because they're sexy and they attract the headlines, but that's not the vast majority of problems that we have. So let's, my suggestion would be let's focus on the low-hanging fruits, let's fix that, and then we can have, or in parallel, we can have a conversation on the really difficult stuff. We have a question up front. Hi, I'm Sasha Moss, and I'm also at the R Street Institute. Anne and I actually share an office. So, tell us about that. How it's a great it? experience. We we share, love each other each every day, and give support. But my question <laughs> is in regard to the EO. Um, panelists mentioned that there's IT modernization. I work in the copyright space, and for example, Library of Congress must go to Congress every year and ask the appropriate funds through the, um, the Subcommittee on Appropriations of the Judiciary. 
and past three years funding has substantially been caught um, yearly. But most of this funding, because they have to do a detailed structure, um, if you bracket it out, one's IT modernization for security. And the copyright office is in charge of depositing copyrights, intellectual property, their software copyrights, for example, and if their systems are not secure, this can then kind of reverberate in the cybersecurity space. So I guess that's the circumspect and long way of asking of, how do we get lawmakers to understand cybersecurity needs and the need to appropriate funds to agencies or technically it's a legislative branch, the Library of Congress and Copyright Office, but I used to work on the Hill and that conversation was never really entertained. So do you have any tips for policymakers or lobbyists to work on this issue? One thing that's interesting to bring up there is uh, within the federal IT modernization budget, it's about $75 billion uh, a year. A lot of it goes towards maintaining old uh, infrastructure. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk lately in the House and in the Senate about solutions to, to move forward in terms of uh, buying new infrastructure and, and implementing it that way and shifting the cost. But that costs a lot of money. And so we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a hesitancy to pursue those, though I think it's really important to do so. Open source. You expected that. Right? I mean, if I were in the, if I were a government, uh, I would work with other governments because you're, 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 all governments are trying to solve the same issues, right? And why not put your money together and have one solution for everyone because it's quite similar. And even if it's only like three governments working together or three states or three counties, you know, you do, I mean, just look at the election stuff. You know, I was talking to somebody at the CSM passcode booth. Um, everyone should stop by. It's on the trade floor, CSM passcode. You can learn about election hacking and and hang out with us. Here, come, here comes my croissant, right? That was for the, for the plug. Um, and, and you talk to somebody there who's um, um, pr trying to promote an open source election uh, you know, algorithm and software. Because the governments, the counties, are using crappy you know, systems that cost $6,000 each you know, from Debolt or so, right? That are 30 years old and easily hackable. You could solve that for all of the United States by just building the software once out in the public and the open under public scrutiny it would be much cheaper than anything you do now, so you would be saving money, right? And you would have a better system at the end. And that applies, I think, to almost all of government IT. Uh, I, I cannot really speak to the US experience, uh, although I do have some experience dealing with Congress, but it's not up to me to, to talk about that. But I can share my experience with the European Union uh, in, in the environment of European Union politics, also to a certain extent our national member states. I think there is one a generational issue uh, it is, I think, understandable that some of the parliamentarians or the top, ex top people in the executives, etc., if they're a bit younger, they tend to understand these issues uh, more readily than some of the older generation. Although I must say that there are exceptions, both Vice President of the European Commission that I lately served under, Vice President Kroos in the previous commission, and Vice President Ansip. I'm a gentleman, so I will not share the age, although I know, but they're not, let's say, they're not youngsters and yet they understand very well the, the issue. I think that in Europe in a way, I, and I'm very reluctant to say that we were lucky, but we, we did have the experience of the cyber attacks on Estonia in 2007, which by and large they didn't really paralyze the country as some people said because within the country things actually work pretty well, but they had a very severe impact on the ability of Estonia as a country to communicate with the rest uh, of Europe, with other European countries. Now, that was a very specific kind of attack for a very specific purpose. I don't believe it had necessarily a lot to do with the Internet of Things, etc. But, you know, when you're in politics uh, and you have such uh, a very... This attack uh, went on the first pages of newspapers all across Europe. And that was 2007, I believe, 2008. Uh, that was not a moment in which people usually talked about cybersecurity on the first pages of newspapers. So that kind of raised already at that point the political attention uh, of policymakers in Europe, and it made it slightly, slightly easier to have that kind of conversation. Having said that, as anybody who has been working as a lobbyist uh, or in the public sector, when you had to ask for money, the conversation is always very difficult. That's a reality. And when you have to ask for money for something that goes beyond the election cycle, the conversation is even more difficult. So I, yeah. I, I, but I, but I do think you have to also you. look at, I mean, one of the things you know, that I've seen is, it, even when you're asking for money, you also have to show that you've actually done what you could with the money you have, and that often means prioritizing it. And so it might, you know, it means that within the agencies, the various federal agencies, 
they're prioritizing at a very senior level, at the minister or secretary level, and not just leaving it to the IT people who are struggling to make all this work. And, and that helps drive the, the progress. So it's not just money. I mean, money's part of it, but it's also policy. But Chris, I wanted you to, as we wrap up here, sort of give us your impression of how that conversation has changed in Washington among lawmakers. Is it just a greater understanding of this issue from what from your perspective? Yeah, I, I think there is. I mean, I think it's been interesting. I've seen this over the course of a number of years. They created a, a subcommittee at the, the Senate Foreign uh, Affairs Committee uh, to deal with cyber for the first time two years ago, and I've testified before them a couple of times. We've testified before the House. There are more and more members who are looking. There's some very savvy members on both, both political parties in both the Senate and the House in the U.S. There are a lot that, just like the rest of the population, don't understand this area. But there's a lot of work that's being done uh, you know, through the, uh, this new Congressional Cybersecurity Caucus, and there's already, always been an Internet Caucus, to try to educate folks about these issues. And, and I do think there's growing understanding. I mean, I, there's still a lot of wh what do we do about it and how can we handle this and looking for some silver bullets. But, but I do think it's, it's significantly better now than it was even five years ago when it's growing, I think. Great. Well, uh, thanks very much. That's all the time we have. I think a lot of us will be hanging around here if you want to continue the conversation. Thanks again to the EU for hosting the conversation.